Good evening. Thank you. And thank you for attending the first Bright Night at the Farm. Before we begin, I must read the following disclaimer. You have chosen to attend tonight's program voluntarily and at your own risk. The organizers accept no responsibility for any paranormal activities that might occur. In the event of an emergency, exits are located to your right and the same way you can think. If you are unwilling to accept this risk, I ask you to depart now. <laughs> You've made your decision now. <laughs> the full moon is rather seductive this evening. Its reflected light dancing on the ripples of the pond are like the starlight of a moonlit night. It's easy to gaze into it and ponder the immensity of it all. Entrancing, wouldn't you say? The air is quite still and mild for late October. Don't you agree? Some might say there's no need for a fire on a night like this. Others would argue it is most essential when the darkness of night is lit by the harvest moon. After all, in its most primitive form, fire was first tamed for our protection. And who are we in the whole vastness of creation anyway? Aren't we but mere creatures scurrying on our way each day? Busying ourselves with self-proclaimed importance. What arrogance we possess. As if our life matters more than anyone else's. Are we invincible? No. I think it is right from time to time. To ponder our place in the cosmos with great humility. Stop and consider how much we don't know. Much less don't understand. We slow our racing minds from our day's business. I'm reminded of a story that may interest you, if you're willing to listen. There was once a storyteller who traveled to places much like this. Small groups of people would, would gather, especially on moonlit nights. And they would listen to his stories. Often they would meet in old abandoned houses, <laughs> poorly lit and shrouded in mystery. Despite the darkness and dismal surroundings, they listened intently. Every word spoken captured their interest. The curiosity in their hearts exceeded the caution of their thoughts. It was as if they were not just unwilling to leave, but entirely unable. In fact, they became paralyzed by his voice. Hmm. Almost entranced, you might say. And so they did the only thing they could do. Listen. As the stories continued, their minds became ever more focused on each syllable spoken. Please feel free to join us. Without any mental effort at all, they recognized patterns in his speech, but only subconsciously. 
His stories had a rhythm, a purpose, I suppose. The words became more poetry than narrative. Those. This quality of his stories, however, was often so subtle, they barely noticed it at all. If it wasn't brought to their attention, they would scarcely be able to articulate the indistinct aftertaste it left in their minds when the story ended. Like an unfamiliar spice, tasted in a new dish causes you to stretch your vocabulary trying to describe it. His stories left you feeling the same way. There was something different, but you just couldn't put your finger on it. Unusual, but tasty and enchanting at the same time. People would depart with a somber demeanor, feeling as though they somehow missed something, as if they drifted off for a bit, lulled by the tone of his voice. They struggled to recall details. In time, they realized they all shared the same ambiguity, only able to describe the intriguing aftertaste of the stories, not the stories themselves. Well, time passed as this storyteller made his way from town to town. Each group he spoke to had similar experiences. This reputation served him well, though, for people's curiosity began to grow. He was scheduling stories with greater and greater frequency. Undoubtedly, this would lead to his eventual downfall. In fact, something was amiss. People's minds were all left with inexplicable gaps. This story was guilty of much more than just telling stories. He was a master hypnotist. So as you leave tonight, try to recall the details of the story I just shared with you. <laughs> Thus ends our first story of the evening. I hope you are enjoying the stories so far. I trust you are. You haven't left. <laughs> this time of year, any storyteller would be remiss if they did not read from the master edgar Allan poe perhaps some of you read this in your youth or childhood but i present to you now the tell-tale heart <laughs> true nervous very very dreadfully nervous i have been and am but why do you say that i am mad the disease has sharpened my senses not destroyed not dulled them. Above all, was the sense of hearing acute. I heard all things in the heaven and in the earth. I heard many things in hell. How then am I mad? Hearken and observe how healthily, how calmly I can tell you the whole story. It is impossible to say how first the idea entered my brain, but once conceived, it haunted me day and night. Object there was none. Passion there was none. I loved the old man. He had never wronged me. He had never given me insult. For his gold I had no desire. I think it was his eye. Yes, it was this. One of his eyes resembled that of a vulture. A pale blue eye with a film over it. Whenever it fell upon me, my blood ran cold. And so, by degrees, very gradually, 
I made up my mind to take the life of the old man and thus rid myself of the eye forever. Now this is the point. You fancy me mad. Madmen know nothing. But you should have seen me. You should have seen how wisely I proceeded. With what caution, with what foresight, with what dissimulation I went to work. I was never kinder to the old man than during the whole week before I killed him. And every night, about midnight, I turned the latch of his door, and it opened, oh, so gently. And then, when I made an opening sufficient for my head, in a dark lantern, all closed, so that no light shone out, and then I thrust in my head. Oh, you would have laughed to see how cunningly I thrust it in. I moved slowly, very, very slowly, so that I might not disturb the old man's sleep. It took me an hour to place my whole head within the opening, so far that I could see him as he lay upon his bed. Ha, ha, ha. Would a madman have been so wise as this? And then, when my head was wet in the room, I undid the lantern cautiously. Oh, so cautiously. Cautiously, for the hinges creaked. I undid it just so much that a single thin ray fell upon the vulture eye. And this I did for seven long nights, every night just at midnight. But I found the eye always closed, and so it was impossible to do the work. For it was not the old man who vexed me, but his evil eye. And every morning, when the day broke, I went boldly into the chamber and spoke courageously to him, calling him by name in a hearty tone and inquiring how he had passed the night. So you see, he would have been a very profound old man indeed to suspect that every night, just this way, I looked in upon him while he slept. <laughs> upon the eighth night, I was more than usually cautious in opening the door. The watch's minute hand moves more quickly than did mine. Never before that night had I felt the extent of my own powers, of my sagacity. I could scarcely contain my feelings of triumph to think that there I was opening the door, little by little, and he not even to dream of my secret deeds or thoughts. I fairly chuckled at the idea, and perhaps he heard me. For he moved on the bed suddenly, as if startled. Now you may think that I drew back, but no. His room was as black as pitch, with the thick darkness, where the shutters were closed fastened through fear of robbers. And so I knew that he could not see the opening of the door. And I kept pushing it on steadily, steadily. I had my head in and was about to open the lantern when my thumb slipped upon the tin fastening, and the old man sprang up in the bed, crying out, Who's there? I kept quite still and said nothing. For a whole hour, I did not move a muscle. And in the meantime, I did not hear him lie down. He was still sitting up in the bed, listening, just as I have done, night after night, hearkening to the death watches in the wall. Presently, I heard a slight groan. I knew it was the groan of mortal terror. It was not a groan of pain or grief, oh no. It was the low, stifled sound that arises from the bottom of the soul when 
overcharged with awe. I knew the sound well. Many a night, just at midnight, when all the world slept, it has welled up from my own bosom, deepening with its dreadful echo the terrors that distracted me. I say I knew it well. I knew what the old man felt and pitied him. Although I chuckled at heart. <laughs> I knew that he had been lying awake ever since the first slight noise. When he had turned in his bed, his fears had been ever since growing upon him. He had been trying to fancy them causeless, but could not. He had been saying to himself, it is nothing but the wind in the chimney. It's, it's only a mouse crossing the floor. Or it's merely a cricket which has made a single chirp. Yes, he has been trying to comfort himself with these suppositions, but he had found them all in vain. All in vain, because death in approaching him had stalked with his black shadow before him and enveloped the victim. And it was the mournful influence of the unperceived shadow that caused him to feel Although he neither saw nor heard, to feel the presence of my head within the room. When I had waited a long time, very patiently, without hearing him lie down, I resolved to open it a very, very little crevice in the lantern. So I opened it. You cannot imagine how stealthily, stealthily, until at last, a single dim ray, like a thread of the spider, shot from out the crevice and found its way upon the vulture's eye. It was open, wide, wide open, and I grew furious as I gazed upon it. I saw it with perfect distinctness, all a dull blue with a hideous veil over it that chilled the very marrow in my bones. But I could see nothing else of the old man's face or person, for I had directed the ray as if by instinct precisely upon the damn spot. And now, have I not told you that what you mistake for madness is but over acuteness of my senses? Now, I say there came to my ears a low, dull, quick, Sound such as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I knew that sound well. It was the beating of the old man's heart. It increased my fury, as the beating of a drum stimulates the soldier into courage. But even yet, I refrained and kept still. I scarcely breathed. I held the lantern motionless. Tried how steadily I could maintain the ray upon the eye. Meantime, the hellish tattoo of the heart increased. It grew quicker and quicker and louder and louder every instant. The old man's terror must have been extreme. It grew louder. I say louder every moment. Do you mark me well? I have told you that I am nervous, so I am. And now, at the dead hour of the night, amid the dreadful silence of that old house, so strange a noise as this excited me to uncontrollable terror. Yet for some minutes longer I refrained and stood still, but the beating grew louder, louder still. I thought the heart must burst, and now a new anxiety seized me. The sound would be so heard by a neighbor. The old man's hour had come. With a loud yell I threw open the lantern and leapt into the room. He shrieked once, only once. In an instant, I dragged him to the floor and pulled the heavy bed over him. I then smiled to find the deed so far done. But for many minutes, the heart beat on with a muffled sound. This, however, did not vex me. It would not be heard through the wall. At length, it ceased. The old man was dead.
I removed the bed, examined the corpse. Yes, he was stone, stone dead. I placed my hand upon the heart and held it there many minutes. But there was no pulsation. He was stone dead. His eye would trouble me. If you still think me mad, you will think so no longer when I describe the wise precautions I took for the concealment of the body. The night waned, and I worked hastily, but in silence. First of all, I dismembered the corpse, along the head, the arms, and the legs. I then took up three planks from the flooring of the chamber and deposited all between the scantlings. I then replaced the boards so cleverly, so cunningly, that no human eye, not even his, could have detected anything wrong. There was nothing to wash out, no stain of any kind, no blood spot whatever. <clears throat> I had been far too wary for that. The tub had caught all. <laughs> when I had made an end of these labors, it was four o'clock, still dark as midnight. As the bell sounded the hour, there came a knocking at the street door. I went down to open it with a light heart, for what had I to fear now? There entered three men who introduced themselves with perfect suavity as officers of the police. A shriek had been heard by a neighbor during the night. Suspicious of foul play had been aroused. Information had been lodged at the police office, and they, the officers, had been deputed to search the premises. I smiled, for what had I to fear? I bade the gentlemen welcome. The shriek, I said, was simply my own in a dream. The old man, I mentioned, was absent in the country. I took my visitors all over the house. I bade them search. Search well. I led them at length to his chamber. I showed them his treasures, secure, undisturbed in the enthusiasm of my confidence. I brought chairs into the room and desired them to sit here and rest from their fatigues while I myself, in the wild audacity of my perfect triumph, placed my own seat upon the very spot beneath which reposed the corpse of the victim. The officers were satisfied. My manner had convinced them. I was singularly at ease. They sat. And while I answered cheerily, they chatted a familiar things. But ere long, I felt myself getting pale and wished them gone. My head ached, and I fancied a ringing in my ears, but still they sat and still chatted. The ringing became more distinct. It continued and became louder. I talked more freely to get rid of the feeling, but it continued and gained definitiveness until at length I found that the noise was not within my ears. No doubt, I now grew very pale, but I talked more fluently and with a heightened voice, yet the sound increased. And what could I do? It was a low, dull, quick sound. Much such a sound as a watch makes when enveloped in cotton. I gasped for breath, and yet the officers heard it not. I talked more quickly, more vehemently, but the noise steadily increased. I arose and argued about trifles in a high key and with violent gesticulation, but the noise steadily increased. Why would they not be gone? I paced the floor to and fro with heavy strides as if excited to fury by the observations of the men. But the noise steadily increased. Oh, God, what could I do? I foamed, I raved, I swore. I swung the chair upon which I had been sitting and braided it upon the boards. But the noise arose over all and continually increased. It grew louder, louder, louder. And still the men chatted pleasantly and smiled. Was it possible they heard it not? Almighty God, no, no, they heard. They suspected. They knew. They were making a mockery of my heart. This I thought and this I think. But anything was better than this agony. Anything was more tolerable than this derision. 
I could bear those hypocritical smiles no longer. I felt that I must scream or die. And now I can't hark louder, louder, louder. Villains, I shrieked, disassemble no more. I, I admit the deed, tear up the planks. Here, here, it is the beating of this hideous heart. Do any of you recall that story from your high school days, perhaps? Do any of you still have nightmares of the telltale heart? <laughs> perhaps they'll be restored this evening. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> is slim. <laughs> you forgot to leave after the last story. <laughs> Speaking of last stories, I have one final story to share with you in the time we have. <laughs> if you're with. This story is entitled The Blue Eyed Poe. <laughs> Long before this farmstead was built, this land was considered an untamed frontier. Of course, there were those who lived here already, the original people, the Lenape. This was their home for centuries before the colonists. They lived according to their own customs for generations, hunting, gathering, gardening, bartering. The Lenape lived at relative peace with one another. Their way of life brought them contentment. They had no necessity to change. But change came nonetheless. The colonists multiplied and spread westward by leaps and bounds, bringing their own traditions and ways with them. From their perspective, they were offering civility to a dark and needy people they did not understand. Among the first to interact were the frontier missionaries, spreading the good news of salvation readily available to the heathens. One man in particular, noted for his zealousness and his way with words was Jacob Black. His fair appearance and was a stark contrast with the darker-skinned natives he brought to, he sought to save. This was of no concern to Jacob, however. Eager as he was to convert, he was convinced he was doing God's work and spent much of his time with the Indians. A lover of language, learning their tongue came easily to him. His services were often well attended as the Indians grew more amazed with his eloquent communication. Of great concern to Jacob, however, were the Poas. These were the spiritual leaders of the people and were believed to have supernatural powers. It seemed as though every time he made progress in converting some Indians, the Poa would perform their magic so they would return their, to their traditional ways. Tensions grew between him and the Poa. Over the years, he confronted them and challenged them with greater fervor. Jacob considered them to be the greatest barrier to his life's work. He began to believe God should just take the Poas out of the world altogether, for they scarcely had any hope of ever becoming good. Jacob once wrote in his diary, I perceived the Indians were afraid to embrace Christianity, lest they should be enchanted and poisoned by the Poas. But I plead, I pled with them not to fear, and I bid a challenge to all these powers of darkness to do their worst on me first. From that time on, 
every thought of mine was consumed with how my truth must prevail. I had countless bouts of sleeplessness, pacing non-stop. I became so agonized in my thoughts, I finally collapsed to the cold ground, utterly exhausted, and thus suffered my final conflict. It was then I discovered the true nature of evil. In the darkness of the night, I experienced what could only be described as infernal powers. Appearing before me was a blue-eyed poa. He made his appearance in his ceremonial garb, which was a coat of bear skins hanging down to his toes, and a great wooden face painted one half black, the other half the color of an Indian skin, with an extravagant mouth cut very awry. He moved toward me with the instrument he used for music in his idol worship. It was a dry tortoise shell filled with dry corn. Coming forward, beating the rattle and dancing with all his might, none of his body was exposed, not even his fingers, which held the idolatrous rattle. No one would have imagined from his appearance or actions that he was even a human creature at all, as his appearance and gestures were so grotesque and frightful. It was unbearable any longer. Then, as if the earth itself stopped turning, he became quiet and still, with a voice barely above a whisper, saying, It is done. It is done. It is all done now. I can never do any more to save myself. I can do nothing more. My heart is dead. I must go to hell. The devil has been in me ever since I was born. I have always served the devil, and my heart has no goodness in it at all. Now, just outside Jacob's home sat a small pond, much like the one here. Normally, its waters provided life and refreshment, but this night, it glowed eerily from the light of the harvest moon. The blue-eyed Poa kneeled down at the water's edge and sought relief from the water. While gazing into the moonlit pond, his mask mysteriously dissolved before his eyes, revealing the face of Jacob Black. <laughs> you may need to think and ponder about that story from beginning to end. But it was inspired by my recent readings of a local missionary by the name of David Green. Some of you may be familiar with the part of Harmony Township called Grainies, named after David Green. If you'd like some interesting reading of your own one, cozy up to a fire with his own personal journal, journal of his spiritual encounters. And with that story, I bid you adieu. <laughs>
perhaps not as scary, <laughs> perhaps more so. <laughs> that will be for you to judge. <laughs> but again, I'd like to thank you for coming to the farm, and as you are greeted by those who are not responsible for any paranormal activities this evening, I'm sure they will welcome you to attend future events here at the Huck Fanatic Farmstead. <laughs> Enjoy History Day coming up next weekend. Many sights to see with our own county of water. Oh, yeah. A lot of history right next door. Did you Go hang on. out? Oh, sorry. Oh, 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 oh. The to blue eye <laughs> is a story that my wife and I just made up this week. <laughs> <laughs> Jacob Blau was from Germany, and his last name Blau is German for blue, <laughs> matching the color of his eyes. The storyteller also was an original story, written just for this occasion. Edgar Allan Poe, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> and many others. Too. <laughs> Thank you for coming this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Great group coming. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoy this. Yeah, I'll put that in the extension.